Good evening, everyone. Railway 3 is up. Like Clockwork Orange, keep your eyes buttered till the end. Okay, more seriously. Railway 3 is up, and with it, a lot of pain. Symptoms include intense burning feelings at 7 o'clock, consistent bleeding by gossipium at 3 hours, contempt in the dark hour, and a lot, a lot of hatred at 10 out of 10. But don't worry, for this video, we'll present you with ways to deal with those symptoms as fast as possible. We're gonna see for each section, its stations, gimmicks and weaknesses, recommended ideas and strategy, and my personal pick of loadout and strategy for the section. Before we begin, some disclaimers. First of all, the railway being only available after Canto 5, it contains bosses from it, so spoiler warning. Second, I know a lot of you won't have all the ideas mentioned, and to this, I have one thing to say. Tough luck. But if you want to clear the railway, you don't need extremely optimized loadouts. And if you want the sub 1 and returned, it is not that hard in my opinion, as long as you have some ideas. I went in with a burn loadout for the wall railway, yes, even section 2, and finished in 84 turns for my first try. The most important thing, outside knowing how stations work, aka reading, is having your IDs leveled up and uptied, and your egos thread spinned. 3 being the minimum for most you'll be using, and 4 for the most important ones. But enough of all that, let's start with a proper introduction of the railway. This railway is overall pretty basic. It features 10 fights divided into sections, 3 sections of 3 stops, and the final one. Once you've done all of them, the railway is over. Everything can be obtained by clearing normally, except one banner if you clear the whole thing under 100 turns. The specificity of this railway is that after each section, there is a stop, in which you not only get your sinners revived and healed, and your negative sanity restored, but are able to change your IDs and egos. This is a pretty big deal, as it allows you to bring specific loadouts to each section made for the fights in it, rather than the all rounded one. Well, on your first try, if you're not going in blind, it doesn't change much, but if you're going in a second time for optimization, or even only for the decorations, it's really interesting. As I said, this will be what this guide focuses on, so let's get to it with the first station. Section 1 includes stations 1, 2, and 3. Starting with station 1, the appetizer. This station consists of two waves of small fries mermaids, with two bigger ones on the second wave. This is a fight to start building up your sanity and sin resources. Smaller mermaids have lower HP and upon death lower others HP. You can easily chain and the fight should be relatively quick. All mermaids are weak to pierce, wrath and pride, so you want to focus those. If you could ally AoE to that, it'd be great, especially because you can't use egos right away. So I can advise Spice Bush Yisang, Magic Bullet Otis and Regret Fox for this. Bullet Otis takes a bit of setup though, but payoff is great. Outside those, Saint Clair is a great choice, as is Twin O'Gregor. Get Young Lu with his skill 1, and the Peak World crew. Right time to mention that Captain Ishmael is being released as I'm writing this, and she seems to be tailor made for the railway, though Mola Ishmael can work well too. The second station is also in two waves. The first one with some more mermaids, still weak to pierce, and slightly to slash now but this time to sloth only sin-wise. Now that you should have some sin resources, I can only recommend using one of the 7 attack weight egos to deal with them, since they all happen to be pierced too, but especially Sang Sunshower, who can almost clear the wave by itself. However, the second wave contains Dream Devouring Silk Current, which works in the same way than its other iterations. It has two parts, both weak to Envy, with its back also weak to Sloth and Pierce. It only has about 1100 HP, so you can deal with it pretty fast with good focus. His body has a stagger threshold around 400 HP. You'll have to take his AoE, which can lead to some damage depending on the ID. To avoid getting one bind and paralysis every turn though, you'll have to break its fluorescence part, which has 330 HP. This can be done quickly in a high burst, but you'll have to tank some attacks to get to it. So having a tank like Gechi Yisang, Keiko Ponglu or Sank Otis can help with this, if you set up a grow the turn before. Gechi Rodion is especially recommended due to the weaknesses too. 
Damage-wise, to set up, St. Clair has his damage mitigated by his lust and gluttony resistances, but can still do some strong damage because of Pierce. Faust X Nail can set up nice things, but requires lots of energy resources, which you might not have yet. Hardcore Pierce Cliff just has the best setup overall with a quick suppression. To inflict the damage though, you have the Pequod crew and middle members, who both hit weaknesses well, though Pequod is Cliff, Stagger Threshold might need to be passed. W Corp members skill 3 can also be very strong to quickly pass it. If you can't make it fall quick enough though, you'll have to clash with his first blind obsession skill for up to 23, and might want to break some flotsam, so he'll use the wayward version on it the next turn. They have the same sin weaknesses, but higher. Unless you just sacrifice a unit. Talking about sacrifices, Station 3, the Drenched Gossipium. This thing's skills will constantly apply Gossipium on your units, which will inflict bleed to the unit if the Gossipium is red stain, which it will be. Overall, this boss will try to make your units bleed to death. So about the sacrifice part. As I said earlier, don't worry about your units dying. Since this is the last fight of the section, your units will be revived next station. Though sanity loss from dying allies could be a problem. This thing also heals from hitting your bleeding IDs, so try to win clashes overall. Against clashable skills at least. Similar to its ego gift, staggered units will get unstaggered in exchange for some bleed. And the two attack power down. But at least you're not staggered. You know who would be glad to slowly get his health reduced while not being staggered? Yeah, because it's Cliff. Him and Ishmael are still great choices for this one, since his weaknesses are pride and wrath, with some slash too. Because of this, good choices also include Ye Chiang Liu or some W Corp members. That's it. Nope, there's no idea that it's Slash, Brass, and Pride. Nope, no, no, la 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 la, I don't see, I don't hear, I don't speak, no evil, I don't see. Okay, so Blind Linear Sinclair is a perfect example on why matching weaknesses isn't always everything. His skill 2 has been so severely power creep that even when doubled with his weaknesses, Sinclair skill 2 crushes it. He has a better skill 3 for this boss though, I'll give him that. But by the time he gets a 10 plus poise count and the potency to actually do about 150 damage, or 190 if staggered, which is strong, true, because Ipium will most likely be dead already. Same for Yis. Though I guess it'd still be good for this fight. Maybe. Especially with a new Ishmael support. You could use a Rupture, Burn or Sinking Comb for it too. However, what also matters is how useful they are in the other fights, because you still have one loadout for the wall section. So let's talk about it now. This loadout would be my pick for this section. In order, he sang as the choice between his Spice Bush and Pequod ID. I'd prefer Spice Bush for AoE on the first fight and for more versatility, while also filling slots for Sun Shower, but if you can set up Pequod right, he can do insane damage on Silk Current. Blade Lineage just feels subpar. Faust has Regret, obviously for first fight, though she could use her Grip ID for Station 2. Dawn can use most of her 3 stars, I settled on middle because of Station 1 and 2. W Rushu is great against Silk Current and Gossipium. W Mersol does nice matchups against Gossipium, and can help set up Envy Res on Station 2 if you want it. Ye Chiang Lu skill 1 against Gossipium is criminal, and can even be used in Station 1. Though Kong Lu also has overall great sin matchups, and W in a lesser measure. Pequod is Cliff made it instead of Rabbit for me because of Gossipia. Captain Ish is the best, Pequod. Uh, period. But Molar can work otherwise. Yeti Rodia on Station 2 is great. Saint Clair for the win. Also, a note that using negative coin IDs makes it very awkward to switch during the right way, so I won't be using Anne Claire nor Saint Cliff. Next, Bullet Otis is better for this section. She can help on Station 1, 3, and her support increases damage on its Sun Sunshower. Last but not least, Twinhood Gregor just does a good work on all stations. My strategy for this section was to first bring Yi Sang, Faust, Otis, Ishmael, Gregor, and Sinclair for the first fight. This comp was selected for one thing, build Sin resources for Sunshower. Using Faust's counter helps building Gloom. Resets can be necessary if you need to win some clashes, but otherwise it's pretty straightforward. Otis Magic Bullet is slow to build, but on wave 2 you can easily hit 3 targets with skill 3. 
you might want to use a block instead of a skill one for this too. Now as I said earlier, e sinks and shower crushes station 2's first wave, dealing 3 quarters of every enemy's health with e sinks passive. If you use another small AoE, you might be able to finish them all in one turn. It's just better to have Yisang act early to profit from weaknesses. To accompany him, I took Ishmael, Heathcliff, Rodion, Ryoshu, and Don. That's where Piquot Yisang skill 2 could help, at least for Handy. My goal for Steel Current was to kill its fluorescent spot in one turn to avoid paralysis, then just deplete its life with Envy nukes. I could tank his skills with most of my IDs anyway, so it wasn't too hard. For Gossipium, I went in with Heathcliff, Onglu, Ryoshu, Mersault, Ishmael, and Gregor. The plan was simple. Tank some things with Heathcliff and use counters. It's pretty strong, grants aggro to get hit, and gets additional base power against lower offense level skills. With his passive added, he does massive damage. And Captain Ishmael just strengthens the playstyle. In the end, just take it down as soon as possible, just avoid being staggered before you counter, as it unstaggers at turn's end. Shoutouts to the 200 damage on Grigor's skill 3 when it was staggered that jumpscared me. We're done for section 1. Now, let's get to section 2, aka the burn field, or the sinking gang's time to shine. We're starting this section with station 5, Hambling Pearl. I'm not gonna mention the shell's resistances, don't bother attacking it. Staggering it doesn't even change them. Though most attacks will come from it, so if you wanted to clash while doing a rupture setup on it, I guess you could. But otherwise, focusing the pearl is a stronger way to deal damage. The most important thing though is to avoid it killing the green slime. As a reminder, its skills consume green slime, which is its form of charge, and this summons up to 3 slimes. If it kills those, it will replenish some of its count. When it's at 0, it gets staggered, its pearl also getting every sin weakness increased, which makes it the perfect time to get beaten up. So you want it to get staggered ASAP. Leaving the slimes alive will also inflict poison on your units, which will slowly deplete the lives. Regarding who you want to bring, most of its skills will be used by the shell, so if you want to avoid spending skills on it, having a dedicated tank to attract some of them can be good. To get rid of the slime more easily, using an AoE can help, ego or not, which can make some of the AoE IDs relevant. Because of the pearl's weaknesses and how the fight works though, they aren't particularly strong damage dealers. Though Blunt, Sloth and Glutony have a small advantage, so some ideas like Mola Otis, Spazbush Yisang, Yechi Rodion or Rosepon or Mersault can get a slight advantage. Tremor is a bit slow but could help staggering the pearl early. But overall most archetypes can work. Now careful, the flames are growing, for the skin Prophet is next. Its encounter functions in the same way as in Kanto 5, with one more candle. So you first have to light the candles by putting them at 1 HP, which gives you a few turns to actually damage it before having to snuff the candles again. About the candles, they each have 28 HP and share Sin's affinities with Skin Prophet. The best way to deal with them is with an AoE Ego. Do you know an Ego that has 5 attack weight and gloom? You have 3 seconds. Faust Fruit Sack, though you can also use another Ego that can one-hit them, like Ebony Stem, Blind Obsession, or even lower attack weight and finish other candles individually. Though a trick to target the candles. Egos without specific targeting will try to find for secondary targets free slots on enemy's side from left to right. However, if they are already being targeted by an ally, they won't be prioritized. So if you target all skin profit slots, the AoE will target candles first. But now that the candles problem is done, about the Amno. Its severe weakness to Gloom makes it a perfect target for the Sinking Gang. Its added Glutony and Slash weaknesses also makes it a perfect target for some Rupture IDs, especially 7 Faust. So those two archetypes can be very strong. Since it has only one part, after turn 1, tanks aren't really needed, but Zvigregor still has great matchups. And the terrain is ablaze! It's time for Hador Blossom Moth. This bug's gimmick is to be stronger, the angrier it is. Its skills will make it gain Ember, which will give its skills Wrath Affinity, which increases some of its skills, as well as activate its passive, 
which increases burn infliction and healing. This notably can make its main attack, a double blossom star, clash for 29. Pretty high. The way to prevent that? Break its wings. Violence. When they are broken, it will lose its embers. Similar to the skin prophet, the wings have a severe gloom weakness, as well as slash, but only accompanied by slots this time. This and their low 300 HP makes them easy to defeat with the right team. And by the right team, this mainly means sinking, because gloom, or rupture, which has a lot of good matchups. This time, having a tank can be good to avoid attacking the body. Not only does it have the same resistances as the wings, its weaknesses are way lower, so focusing the wings is the best way to quickly deal with the moth. Having a tank to take the body's hits can then be useful, Zvigregor still having very good matchups. The last thing to be worried about is that your unit's health will slowly diminish. One of its first skills is an unclashable AoE, which doesn't do damage, but will inflict some burn of your units, as well as Shimmering Ember, which is a proxy for potentially high burn inflection by one of its skills. Overall, it should be okay. Or not, if you start stacking too much burn. Be careful of unwanted staggers. Though, this is the last station of the section, so units will be healed. So now, what do you bring for this section? As this section happens to be a boss rush, bringing damage archetypes like Sinking or Rupture might be your best bet if you set them up quickly, Gloom being especially strong on stations 6 and 7. Though there aren't pride resistances, Burn might have trouble because of the Wrath and Lost ones. Bleed is... not strong enough, I think. And will also have Lost problems. Tremor is probably too slow too. Overall, Slash is good, but not Pierce, so some W Corp IDs or Poise ones maybe. But here's my loadout for this one. I decided to go with the Sinking Gang for this section. You might have noticed the bug in the room, but let's go in order. Splash Boo Shi Sang is a prime Sinking member, with good scene matchups, though Pierce is a bit annoying. I chose 7 Faust next for a scene and type matchups, since I wanted to use her on Skin Prophet anyway, but triggered Faust to deal with Embling Pearl more easily would be totally valid, though AoE might trigger Candle's counters in the following station, so you might not want to bring her there. Dawn is not planned to be used, so I just took W Corp for support. Note that Lantern has good matchups overall and is a good tank, especially with Rupture. Ryoshu has their chef ID for support too, good against Embling Pearl Hats. Mersault has middle also for support, so Rodion gets back some SP after Rhyme Shank. Yichi Anglu is the newest sinking member. Two Krabbit is Cliff for support. Molar Ishmael and Yichi Rodion are prime sinking members too. Mariachi Sinclair for passive, a bit by default, though you could take him for sinking too, I guess. Gregor has Vi for scene matchups. Now, why did I choose G Corp Otis? Well, sinking is incomplete. There aren't too many great sinking ideas outside the four currently in. I didn't know if I'd be able to maintain sinking with too many coins and wanted some potency support. G Corp Otis has low coin numbers, fixed at one, okay clashes overall, and good support abilities, as well as good scene matchups so I just felt like including her. However, let me mention that Molar Otis has a better matchup against Embling Pearl and helps Ishmael and Yisang with self tremor afterwards, though they won't need it too much. Sank Otis can be a good evade tank too, with good sun shower support for sinking. My strategy is simple. Not. Gloom resources for Rhyme Shank are very scarce after section 1, so using it on Embling Pearl is tough. With good management though, you might be able to set up something on the pearl in a few turns. Though most of my efforts will be focused on getting it staggered ASAP. I took my 5 sinking members there, plus Gregor for tanking. To get rid of all slimes at once, a few egos are good, like Yi Sang for Smash Flame, Onglu's Rosy Desire, Faust's Representation Emitter, or Otis Holiday, for example, to not consume Gloom. I just read it for a setup for Onglu's Insight. After that, the fight is pretty straightforward though. I just have to quickly sink it down. Next, for Skin Prophet, I bring Faust instead of Gregor. First turn, I try to get a setup for Anglo's Insight again, and also want to be able to set up Rhyme Shank and Sinking on Skin Prophet already, without getting staggered by its skills and counters. 
Afterwards, I just sink the body down really quickly while cashing with its skills. Lastly, the moth. I take back Gregor for tanking duties against the body. Otherwise, setup is the same, with Ramshank popping off ASAP if I can. I have to keep a few Gloom resources for next station though. I break the wings in one or two turns to avoid turn 3 complications and proceed to bring it down. I saw attempts with sinking where it was possible to do all of the stations in two turns each, I'm Pearl with a more regular nuke setup though. But what I just showed you, however, was an attempt before Captain Ishmael where I had some gloom. In my latest attempt though, I ended up gloomless. So I thought of experimenting with the rupture comp. Don't worry, I'll explain it to you for another section. But the result was pretty good. I actually broke the shell on the Embling Pearl, which did remove its type resistances. With Sinkless Talisman setup, I could start building high damage after turn 2 or 3. I ended up doing as good as my other attempt with 4 turns hitch. Though you probably can do it in 2 turns with Rupture. Maybe it's right worse. But enough about this section. Let's move on to the best part of the railway. By best, I mean worst. But before getting into the worst, worst part, let's do some EXP excavation. Well, that's what Station 9 is an upgraded Stage 5 of EXP excavation. If you haven't done it yet, I don't know how you can be level 40 on most IDs, but the fight consists of two waves of pallid things and mermaids, weak to pierce. In this one, it's about the same, with an added wave and higher levels. So I have to first warn you, as those increased levels increase their power overall. They all also get passive, giving them a bunch of offense and defense level, the more of their allies are alive, so careful. The weaknesses are a bit different too. I hope you kept some thin resources, because if you want to speed up the fight, you'll have to throw a bunch of egos. Starting with wave 1, a bunch of paladified things. There are two sets of weaknesses, but Lust and Envy are shared, then it's either Blunt for CCB or Pierce for Pirates. They don't have much health, so they'll fall quickly. Most of their passives don't matter too much if you deal with them like usual, outside of the stats increasing 1. Since there are 6 of them, AoE for the win. They all share lust and blunt weaknesses, so some of the best egos to use include Iscliff Yasunyatata Rupam, Sinclair's Lifetime Stew, or his 9 Stew. Other lust AoE egos are useful, though slash ones won't be as much. 7 attack waves are, as usual, also strong. The second wave includes a few different mermaids, which, unfortunately, have barely any weaknesses in common. The most notable ones are Pride, Envy, and Pierce. So obviously, a fair day for Ishmael's blind obsession. However, since they have pretty different weaknesses, hard to advise other particular egos outside of high attack weight ones, except for gloom and slash ones. You might want to use a few with lower attack weight on specific enemies to speed it up, for which you can use the redirection trick mentioned in the skin profit part, though they all have high stagger thresholds, so you can easily stagger them and profit from it. Still, careful to clashes. The third wave has three big mermaids. And while they look more menacing, they just have slightly higher resistances. An ego can soften them up to get them faster, but overall good focus from pride and envy skills will quickly get rid of them. For the wall fight, I'd then advise to take sinners with good egos for this one, and then good sin matchups, especially the Pico Pro. Hook or W Corp Anglu, middle siblings, and sync members are also good choices. Just as a heads up though, since all enemies are higher level, Captain Ishmael might lose a lot of sanity during the fight. Now let's get to it. Yes, it. The source of all evil. Station 10. The fight starts with a wave of Pequot Town villagers. They have Pierce, Pride and Gluttony weaknesses, so you know the drill already. They are resistant to slow though, so Sancho won't be as good. Overall, Egos will speed up the fight, and having appropriate scenes will help, so about the same ideas as the station before. They are still Pequod villagers, so careful about clashes. But we're getting into wave 2, Triple Trouble. If you don't remember the fight, it's... Uh, it's a mess. On turn 2, Ayeb will use skills, so starting turn 3, she hard focuses the unit designated the turn before with Starbuck, while Quick Craig attracts any skill targeting her, making it impossible to clash or defend until you deal enough damage to break Quick Quick's shield. 
This will often mean one of your units suffering a crushing death. So how do you deal with this? There are a few ways. The first one is accept the loss. One of your units might be sacrificed. You first bring down Stabber quickly, as he is the more frail of the three, to reduce the load, and then hard focus Quickwag, who will be staggered if you remove her shield quickly. That's about 100 HP. Afterwards, you can try finishing her, or just focus on Hayab. Now, if you don't want to sacrifice a unit, what you can do is leave Starbuck alone and have a good evade skill, like Synchrotis, W Rushu, or Ting Tang Honglu. You cannot target Hayab, but you can target Starbuck. So if you first evade Starbuck's attacks, and he's likely to attack first because of higher speed, you'll be able to evade Hayab too, as long as you roll heads. So you can focus on Quick Quag and then Hayab. Just be careful, as Quickwag has the second life, and Ayeb fully heals once when brought under half HP. Overall weaknesses are mixed, so what you want to bring depends on who you want to focus. But overall, Pierce, Pride and Envy are once again stronger overall. Many try to avoid Slash, Lust, Sloth or Gloom. Yes, that's a lot. So as usual, you can make a mirror, or bring middle for Quickwag, as well as other previously mentioned IDs. So that's the slow method, but we want to optimize, gotta go fast. So did you know killing Ayab ends the fight? The old hag's gonna take it! Hard focusing her with appropriate skills to stagger her first turn to prevent her from using assist skills is worth it. Though you'll need to tank most of the other two's attacks for that, so having a good tank setup with aggro is needed, especially if evading or resistant to pierce. You'll still have to go with a face switch and full heal, so careful about that. But with enough damage, you can stay your hair each turn, though it might need some resets. By the way, don't try to kill her on phase 1, it doesn't work. She's weak to Pierce and Envy, so as usual, Equot, Sang, and a few others are great for this. The fight is pretty complicated, so there can be other ways to go through it. For example, while they all heal SP regularly, Using sinking to bring it down and panic them at least for one turn, more on phase 2. Or you can try using rupture to quickly bring down the captain, making a talisman setup during the first wave, but she remove ailments from herself when she switches fate. Once you get rid of the old woman, you're finally done with the station. But wait, there's more! For the old dag is back! Just alone this time. This fight is also a copy from Kento 5, so you can deal with it in the same way. So what's the way? Well, it's none of those. This fight has three phases, and when she switches phase, it removes ailments on her, so you'd have to rebuild every time. Tough. Poison charge are more lucky here though. But anyway, on each phase, she has one of her crew's ego, giving her strong buffs. You have to remove the count to stagger her and take the advantage to bring her to 1 HP which makes her switch phase. Fun fact, burn damage does not make her switch phase. Very tough. In the first phase, she has an annoying reusable evade and a strong nuke. You want to win a clash against it later, so prepare an ego. Otherwise, there is no other way. Winning clashes against murky innocence also reduce the evade power, so that's good. Second phase, she gets protection every turn as long as she has ego. Some of her skills will make her inflict prey mark on your units. When units with this status win clashes, they reduce the ego's count. And she has a strong but perfect skill for this. You might want to prepare an ego for this one, and be careful about who gets targeted. The last phase is... horrible. At combat start, she gets between 70 and 140 shield, which also reduces your SP when hitting it. If you don't remove this shield by the end of the turn, she gets ego count. Otherwise, she loses it. You can also reduce the count by winning clashes against Bleached Atonement to speed up the process, and you should. Because it comes with a counter, that can be reused depending on the Ego count. You'll take at least 4 of them turn 1, and can reduce to 2 or less afterwards. But this will hurt. She'll also get stronger the lower HP, so this will hurt. But you have no choice. Just hit her as hard and fast as possible. A reminder, this is the last fight of the section, so get your units killed if you need to. So how to deal with this? Well, first, I said sinking isn't necessarily good, 
but reducing our SP can really help dealing with some of our stuff. But otherwise, just hit her. Her weaknesses being peace, grass, pride and envy, well, we know what to bring again, don't we? We have a few more options this time though, notably Encorp. So, what do you bring for the- Well, I think it's obvious enough. You don't really want to bring Slash into any of this, neither much of archetypes outside pause or charge, but charge is mainly Slash. Anyway, this is my choice. Pico Desang with some familiar support, Regret Faust AoE on Station 9 will be great though. Middle Dawn might be useful. Chef Yoshu is for support again, and so is Middle Muscle, but his Encorp ID can be useful. Wukong Lu has great mashups, but Ting Tang can be good in wave fights. Pico Discliff and Ishmael are the stars. Rodion's LCB ID still has a great passive, though an Encorp ID should be mentioned. Sinclair is strong, and Sankoti is here too for evade duty. Twin Hook Gregor's support is good in this team, and can be useful in fight too. I have to mention Encorp having overall good matchups here, at least Rodion and the 3 stars. As for my strategy, I bring Eastcliff and Ishmael to bring down the thunder on the vermin. To clean up I took Faust, Anglu, Sinclair, and Otis. I use Yasunyata with Eastcliff on 1, and might use Lifetime Stew with Sinclair. Second wave, I first use Ishmael's Blind Obsession to soften up the wave, and then proceed to clean up with the rest. The last wave also goes smoothly, and depending on the situation, I might use another Ego to ensure a quicker kill. Going into station 10, I just replaced Faust by Gregor for stronger focus. On the first wave, I would blind obsession again and ideally Ebony Stem to quickly clear the wave. Though here I have a problem, which is that I'm gloomless, and I need to use Eastcliff Yasunyata for resistances, as well as trying to get him staggered so he can tank next wave. When I get to Hayab, I burst her just enough to get her under half HP for phase 2, usually only quick quag being able to deal significant damage to my units. I still try to re-target some skills with Otis. On phase 2, if targeting is unlucky and I couldn't build aggro, I might have to sacrifice someone, so I can still stagger Ahab quickly, being able to finish her in 2 more turns. Lastly, Gas Harper. I take back most of the team, with Yi Sang replacing Honglu. With the high enough burst, I manage to bring down the first phase in 2 turns. The next phase can't be as fast because of the protection though, so it takes a few turns to stagger her and bring her down, after being careful about prey marks. The last phase, I have to get a few staggers unfortunately, and it takes time to bring her down. I like healing in this composition, but after a while she's finally down. There are ways to optimize this section more, but I'm getting very tired. So let's go on to the next and final station. Now it's time for Spiral of Contempt. Uh, contempt! Contempt! Contempt. Yeah. Anyway, this fight is not straightforward. There are two ways for it. The you'll die by elements way, and you'll die by punches way. Let's start with the latter, with a proper introduction. Spiral of Contempt has two body parts, the body and the hands, resistances to everything, and several specific statuses. When hitting the hands, you gain the first one, Gaze. Gaze increases the damage dealt by your units, proportional to its count. Great, right? Except, not really. Once you get to 7, it will become Contempt instead, which is way less ideal. It drains your sin resources and gives you damage down. So keep Gaze and avoid Contempt, right? Well, more or less. There is another mechanic less understood, which is Grasp. It will use, starting first turn, each old constrict, which inflict grasp on a unit when hit. Grasp is poorly explained, but also hard to explain without seeing it or writing an essay. It summons a grasp enemy, which immobilizes the grasp unit, dealing huge damage to it over time. Seeing the effect written like this makes much more sense suddenly. So your mission is to rescue them. It doesn't have weaknesses nor resistances, and 112 HP, so you'll have to commit a bit for it. Be careful of the spiral skills, meanwhile. But that's annoying, so why not just avoid it? Because freeing the unit causes an event. This event, in two parts, allows you to choose one type and then one scene to transmit to the spiral, which it will then be weak to for the rest of the fight. This is the point where you can nuke it down as soon as turn 3. 
It also gives it 3 fragile the following turn, if the unit had contempt, but you need to build it up for 2 more turns. It does remove contempt for other units, so it's a good way to reset the situation if you're slower. It has a final status at less than 30% HP, which is basically a ticking time bomb. So for this, as there is no specific matchups, you can bring whatever you want. However, it's better to focus on one scene and or type to benefit from the bonuses. A prime example would be the middle with Envy, or W Corp with Envy nukes and charge. Pride with Poison Pierce can be good too, or Tremor with Sloth and Blunt. Archetype 7 Advantage 2 has Spiral of Contempt as a passive, giving it Sin Fragility if the archetype is built. So that's a great time to talk about archetypes, because the other way is forget Grasp, Contempt and everything. We are brute forcing. This Amno has more than 2000 HP and resistances, so it's a perfect time to build some archetypes on it. So we ignore its mechanics and just inflict it with burn, bleed, rupture or sinking until it's down. In order, I'd say bleed is the hardest and slowest to build and profit from, then burn as it's a bit slow, sinking can build quickly if you still have gloom for rhyme shank, and even though it's gloom resistant, you can spend some resources to pass the event and make it gloom weak. Note that you can do that too with burn and dark flame. Rupture is probably the best though. Talisman Sinclair goes brrrr. Overall, I'd say it's a faster way to clear it. However, using nukes to stagger and break the hands early to give it weaknesses can be a good strategy. Though the hands will regenerate, so careful. Also, this is the last station, so don't hesitate to throw all your kitchen at it. As for me, I did go with the Rupture strategy. I use this team composed of W E Sang, 7 Faust, Lantern Dawn, K Young Lu, 7 Is Cliff, and Tysman Sinclair, with 4 Rupture support, W E Yoshu, Rose Pawner, Gregor, and Slushing Ishmael only useful if I can break some Tremor, and the others for general damage or SP support. The fight in itself is pretty simple. Use Yi Sang's Dimensional Shredder for passive, and set up a Sinclair skill 2 on the non ruptured part to get the 5 talismans at up die 4. Then proceed to apply it to the spiral next turn, preferably the end, and then. Yeah, it goes down real fast. And that's it for the railway. As I said, finishing it under 100 turns isn't too hard already, but if you optimize just a few things, it can be really easy. But going slower means more resources and more leeway. I didn't mention it. But if you're having trouble, using base support egos like Chains of Others or Cross Eye View can really help. The other part still being Section 3, which might take a few, or a lot, of retries, but as long as you know what's happening, it should be okay. Looking back on this run, I'd say I was missing too much gloom, and should have built it up more, especially in Section 1. I could have shaved a few turns with more tries, and especially better setups, but I've been on this long enough already. So I'll be satisfied with this result, I think. How much turns? Uh, 54. Well, that's very far below 100. As a final note though, there are a few more IDs coming up before season's end if you check the guaranteed 3 star season 3 banner. Most likely with a yield my <laughs> yield my flesh to claim their bone side kento. Those will probably be poison pride, which can be very good for the railway too. And finally, maybe complete the poison archetype. However, I very likely won't come back to this railway. As I said, I am content. C content, content. N no, no, this one. Ah! And that concludes this video. Thanks for watching. Final message: I have two videos planned by the end of the season. However, only one is guaranteed for now. I should start streaming next week with weekly Limbus content. I'll do some other stuff over time, though. But anyway, see you next time, and keep your sanity high in this slow descent into the inferno.